Listen as our choir sings the cross medley.
choir. Take your hymnals once again, page 779. Stand with us. Make that, yeah, 779. I'll fly away. Please stand with us. <laughs> Sing that first. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah. Let's play through that a time or two. Get around, shake hands with your neighbor. Sing that second. Please be seated. And right now we have Brother Enoch to come sing for you. A borrowed tomb, 
on the third day oh that rose again did bloom now to the highest heaven down to the deepest hell the fragrance of heaven's rose continually dwells the most beautiful Beautiful rose was broken one day, nailed to a tree on a hill far away, forsaken by his friends, bruised by his foes. How sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose. How sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet Thank you, Enoch. Great job, as always. And welcome to the Pioneer Baptist Church. Do we have any first-time visitors with us? Who's introducing whom? You just uh, tell us who you are and where you're from? Yes. Thank you very much. Good to have you with us. Now, is Eggie a good worker? There she is? Yeah. Okay, good. We need to check by people that are, from people that are non-partial. Well, great to see everybody. We've got some old friends and uh, people here. Great to see you again, all of you, and God bless you. A couple announcements. Number one, here's a track. It's a little cartoon for him. It's a great one, very inviting. God loves you. God's Word, the Bible says, and gives you John 3.16. Three wonderful things about God's love. How can I get rid of my sins? And it tells you, God sent his son. Can I become his child now? You bet you can. And it tells you, just insert your name. For God so loved Jerry Mitchell. That he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That if Jerry Mitchell will believe in him, Jerry Mitchell will not per perish but have everlasting life. So nice little thing. Put your name right in there and ask God to save you. And he never said no. Amen. Amen. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Right. February 15th, that's this uh, Saturday. Valentine dinner at 6 o'clock. Consumer-friendly price at $12 a person. We uh, were all filled up on the sign-up sheet, so I drew, drew some more lines because we need some more people. We may go in the red on this thing if you don't sign up. Okay, and then uh, if that happens, uh, we might not be able to pay our mortgage. Church might go bankrupt. So if you haven't put your name down on a list yet, you should be ashamed of yourself. And uh, why not come out and hang around with our brothers and sisters? We don't have a lot of events. And uh, here's a chance to come hang around and fellowship and just have a great time. And you do not need a date or a husband or wife to come. If you'd like to come stag, we'd love to have you. So uh, there's room on the sheet. We'll have people watching. We know if your name's not on there, and they'll be watching at the door with uh, AK-47s. So make sure you get your get your get signed up. We want you to come. We'll have a good time, but not as good time without you. If you come, it'll be better. All righty, February 22nd, work day, anniversary of the week. Steve and Jan Cedabaka. All righty. Congratulations. Shall we sing happy anniversary? <laughs> happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. 
happy anniversary to you. And uh, I guess that's about it. Gentlemen, why don't you come? We'll take our Sunday morning offering. It's not about that. Don Burke is in the hospital. They're running some tests on him, so keep him in prayer. Brother Galloway had some tests done this week, and they came out good, so praise the Lord on that. And let's just keep each other in prayer, amen? And we've got some older folks here uh, that need prayer. How are you today, Larry? You all right? All right, good, good. All righty, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. God, we ask you to bless our offering, and God, thank you that we can be together to worship you. And God, we've got some two first-time visitors and other people that have come here for a few weeks, and God, we're so thankful, old friends that we haven't seen maybe for a while, and what a wonderful thing it is to see God's people in God's house. Thank you for it. God, would you bless as we sing and praise you and preach your word. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. Take your hymnals once again, please. 781. Stand with us. We'll sing face to face. Page 781. Please stand with us. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold. Kids, you're dismissed. Sing that last. Face to face, oh blissful moment. Face to face to see and know. Face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loves me so. Face to face I shall be starry sky face to face in all his glory I shall see him my own home. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And now we have Julie to come sing. And as she comes, a couple more requests. Uh, Avonda's not feeling well today. Keep her in prayer. And uh, Shirley and Jean Getz went to uh, urgent care. Bad colds and all of that stuff. So a couple more prayer requests for you. Thank you.
There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree, and it whispers, draw closer to me. Leave this world far behind, there are new heights to climb and a new place in me you will find for whatever it takes to draw closer to you Lord that's what I'll be willing to do That's what I'll be willing to do. Take the dearest things from me, if that's how it must be, to draw me closer to thee. Disappointments come Lonely days without the sun If through sorrow More like you I become For whatever it takes To draw closer to you, Lord that's what I'll be willing to do For whatever it takes To be more like you That's what I'll be willing to do Sunshine for rain, laughter for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do for whatever it takes for my will to break. That's what I'll be willing to do Oh, that's what I'll be willing to do Thank you, Julie and Carla. Thank you very much. This won't be the first time that I've preached on this subject, and might not be the last time, although we never know when the last time we're going to preach is. But I've been fascinated uh, over the years over what a big difference a little matter can make. What a big difference a little matter can make. And you don't need to turn, but over in James, the Bible says of the tongue, as one example, even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, I'm not preaching on the tongue today particularly, just to use that as an illustration. I don't know who it was, Sam Jones, or one of those guys that we talked to. I always, Sam Jones, who's the other guy I always mix up with him, my Enoch? Billy Sunday and Sam Jones. You know, maybe they were twins or something. I don't know. They were born way before my time. And uh, so when illustrations come along, some lady came down and said, you know, I've sinned. I need to lay my tongue on the altar. 
And the preacher said, I, you can't, the altar's not long enough. But anyway, there's one, one illustration, and uh, like I said, we're not talking about the tongue. Another one is over in Sol Song of Solomon, where uh, the Bible speaks of the little foxes that spoil the vines. The little, take the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. And that's all from a negative standpoint, and you know me, I don't like to be negative. There is the positive side as well. And if we take a look at the positive side, I've given you these illustrations before, but uh, since repetition is the key to learning, we'll repeat them again. Charles Atlas. You know, I spoke to a lady on the phone the other day, and uh, I said, do you remember a group called the Fifth Dimension? And she said, no. Now, it doesn't seem like that long ago, does it, when the Fifth Dimension was making hits and everything? But if people don't know who the Fifth Dimension is, they sure don't know who Charles Atlas is, right? <laughs> You've got to be a certain age to have any clue about that. But uh, anyway, he was a bodybuilder before steroids and everything. I mean, the real kind of bodybuilder. And uh, he said, give me 15 minutes a day and I'll make a man out of you. On the positive side of the ledger. Now, I don't read my Bible enough, but what I've done over the past 39 years has taken me through the nine, uh, New Testament 95 times. I'm not bragging about that. I'm just saying you do a little every day. I don't do it enough, but I, you stay with it a little bit. If you live long enough, you'll get some stuff done. Gone through the Old Testament 36 times. About time to hit the Old Testament again. And then I'm uh, going to get back and try to read through the New Testament uh, four or five times. I've always said I wanted to read through the, I've told you this, I always said I wanted to read through the New Testament a hundred times before I die. And now I'm thinking of stopping at 99. The uh, Johnny Wooden was a great basketball coach. We hate athletic illustrations, but we'll use one today. And he's cited as uh, one of the big reasons for his unparalleled college coaching success is when he added four more rims in his gym on the sides. So you're scrimmaging this way. He had a couple rings, rims here, a couple rims here, and he would rotate people in and out. So a guy would be over there on the sidelines shooting foul shots. And when he hit 10 of them, I think it was, he'd rotate back in and somebody would rotate out. And he said that made a big difference in his team. And he'd say, how can that make such a big difference? You know, doesn't sound like much. And uh, Johnny Wooden said this, I think very definitely it's the little things that make the big things happen. It's the little things that make the big things happen. And Johnny Wooden, I'm quoting from him now, he said, it's putting your shoes on properly. Well, that makes sense. If you put them on backwards, they wouldn't work very well. It's getting the wrinkles out of your socks so you won't get blisters. Those are important things, according to Johnny Wooden. And I believe that all truth is Bible-based. I believe that all truth is Bible-based. Jesus is the truth. The Word of God is the truth. And when we don't submit to the truth, even on what either we or the world may consider to be little things, it can and probably will have a huge negative impact on our lives. The world may consider things to be little things that God doesn't. And if we get caught up in it, it's a problem. In today's world, our Bibles are attacked on a daily basis. Probably could say on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And I feel pretty sure that there's nothing new about that. But there have been times in the history of the world when things have been worse than at other times. I'm sure that the nature of man has never changed. It's been sinful, disobedient, all of that. But there have been times in the history of the world when things have been worse than at other times, like right before the flood. And the Bible says in Genesis that God saw the wickedness of man, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, the two key words in there for me are every and continually. Not just some of the imaginations. God said that he looked on, he looked on man and saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I believe we're in another of those times right now, to be honest with you. We're not only attacked by the world, 
were also attacked by those who named the name of Christ, but who also reject the book that Jesus taught from. People are out there saying they're Christians and everything, but oh, they don't believe this about the Bible, they don't believe that. And we used to call them liberals. But now we don't do that anymore. We've become more enlightened. Now we call them progressives. Now, one such little thing is a Bible translation issue. Now, this was supposed to be a Sunday night message, but I turned it into a Sunday morning message. And I want to be careful. I don't want to insult. We've got a good crowd here. We've got some guests and visitors. It's not my intention to drive people away. So don't let this bother you too much. And if you've got questions, come see me and I'll, I'll give you my answers. But one thing that is considered to be a little issue in the world is a Bible translation issue, otherwise known as the King James only issue. It's just a little thing. Well, I don't believe it's as little as they would have you believe. It's a whole lot more than the these and the thous. It's about verses in your Bible and blocks of verses, whole blocks of them. It's about the deity of Christ in certain verses. It's about bringing everyone together, and that's a quest of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist wants to have, make sure he's got his own Bible to convince everybody with. So he's going to write his own Bible and get Christianity to accept it, is my, my belief. Seems like a little thing, but it's not. It's a very big thing. Now, there is rebellion underlying the lack of respect for the little things. If you're just blowing off the little things... Rebellion is behind it somewhere. It may be self-interest. It may be money. It may be pride. It may be lust of the flesh. It may be lust of the eye. But somewhere down deep, there's rebellion. It may be a very subtle rebellion. But a little rebellion is like a little case of cancer. Or being a little bit pregnant. You ain't got a slight touch of pregnancy. And that's where, that's where rebellion is. That's, that's not that big a deal. Well, over in 1 Samuel chapter 15, if you'd like to turn there. If not, I'll just read it to you. But 1 Samuel chapter 15. And you'll know, uh, if you know your Bible well, that <clears throat> we're over there with Saul and Samuel. King Saul. First guy that started out being little in his own eyes. Then he got big in his own eyes. And then he got little in God's eyes. There's an inverse proportion there, my friends. Well, over in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, we read the following. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. I've told you the story about, uh, his name was Donnie Strout. I'll just say it. I won't tell you the whole story because you never know when they're going to come arrest you. But uh, Donnie Strout was in my sixth grade uh, class when I was teaching before I went to Bible college. And I said, okay, take out your books. And he didn't take his out. I said, Donnie, you're going to take your book out? Only 14 to 15 kids in the class. And he said, uh, no. I said, how come? You know, curious. How come? He said, I don't know. just got a stubborn streak in me today. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's go see Mr. Littlefield. He was a principal. <clears throat> so he said, okay. <clears throat> and we were, <clears throat> excuse me, I, Dr. Smith's disease is contagious, and my throat is starting to get bad. But uh got to watch your company you keep. The um, So we walked out, and I shut the door, and we were downstairs in the uh, foundation area of the Bangor Baptist Church with uh, block walls and everything, and I grabbed him and picked him up. He was littler than me. I put my nose against his. I said, we're going back in and open that book up. And he said, yeah, okay. And I put him back down. He went back in. He opened his book up. Just a little bit of stubbornness. You know? A little bit of rebellion. He didn't even know why. You know, maybe you're rebelling against God and you really don't even know why. You know, maybe your parents didn't like God or, or maybe, you know, some of the people you're working with don't like God. And all of a sudden you've got this this thing against uh, just, you know, lining up being conformed to the image of Christ. And all of a sudden there's a little rebellion going in there. Maybe you haven't thought about it, but it's not good. Well, anyway, 
Uh, the Bible says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And Samuel said to Saul here, Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now let me give you just a little background. Chapter, uh, verse 3 of the same chapter. God told King Saul, Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, why did God uh, tell him to wipe them out that, that completely? I, you'd have to answer that. Man, maybe as good as I could. But God knew what he was doing. Now, so Saul goes in, and then down here in verses 8 and 9, uh, well, let's read verse 7. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agad, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, or refused that, they destroyed utterly. So Saul said, our oh, God doesn't really know what he's doing here. What's the sense of killing a good oxen? Might as well take him back. And the king, hey, let's give the king a little credit. I'm a king, he's a king. Let's show him a little leniency. But that's not what God told him to do. Now, seems like a small thing. But Samuel said, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, there's a lot more to this story of Saul and how he was rebellious and how he tried to get Samuel to work with him and all of that. But my point in citing this example is this. When God says to do something, we should do it. Now, let me be perfectly clear. God had his reasons, and he was right. But in the New Testament, we're not out here trying to kill the Muslims. Amen? We're not out here saying, okay, let's arm ourselves with AK-47s and go kill the Mormons. We're not doing that. That's not what God is telling us to do. He's telling us to take the gospel to them. He's telling us to love them. Amen. Okay, that was a time of war. Hey, I may not understand it. I'll be glad when there is no more war. And the Lord's coming back, and there's going to be a couple of big ones when he comes back. It's going to be Armageddon, and there's going to be another one after that. And that's just the way it is. But I'll be glad when there is no more war. And when we can love each other, and love each other as we should. But one of the ways we show that we love people is to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. To tell them that Jesus loves them. That he died for their sins, was buried and rose again. And if they'll put their trust in him, they'll be saved for all eternity. That's our message. But it seems like just a little thing. And then if you would, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. One of the things we really need to get into our head is this. God's word. We're not supposed to outthink God. If he says to confess your sins and receive Christ, well, that ought to be enough. If he says, read your Bible, pray and go to church, that ought to be enough. If he says to witness to people, that should be enough. We shouldn't be dicing up his commands and trying to figure out if he really knew what he was talking about when he said it. We need to just take it and do it. That's what we need to do. Now, if you go to Genesis chapter 19, verse 15, the Bible says this. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. So you got a couple angels there uh, in Sodom. They hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men, that's the angels, laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. True. And thou hast magnified thy mercy. True. Which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. True. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold now, 
This city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. All right. This city, the whole now this city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one, God. God said, get to the mountain. He said, well, I don't want to go to the mountain. Right? Look at that, I know, we're going to get out of the city, you're going to destroy it. But look, he's just a little, just a little one, God. Now God allows him to do it. I don't like it when Lord or anybody else petitions God contrary to his word. Why would we go down and pray and ask God to do something contrary to what he's revealed to us in his word? I don't like it. I don't like it a lot. I don't like it in you. And I don't like it in me. We need to watch out for that kind of thing. Even if it's just a little petition. A little one, you know, no big deal. Oh yeah, God said that, but I don't think it's any big deal. Probably the same thing Saul said. He said to kill everybody, but you know, I don't think he really meant that literally. Hmm? We'll just keep some of the good oxen and all that. And you know, when, by the way, when Samuel came up to greet him, he said, Blessed art thou of the Lord, I have kept the Lord's commandment. Might be a paraphrase there, but it's pretty close. And Samuel said, you know, he hears this in the background. He said, what's the bleeding of these lambs? Oh, well, he said, the people, the people made me do it. Right. Let me tell you something. When I try to use that excuse, my wife doesn't buy it. Let alone God. Amen? Amen. Look, it didn't fly. We got excuses. We got alibis. We got all of that. But God told him to do something. He didn't want to do it. Now we're over to Lot. Lot's making these petitions. God saves his life. God grabs him, pulls him out of the city, says, grab your daughters, get out of here, don't look behind you, and head for the mountains. Oh, that's okay, God, but, you know, hey, look, there's a little city over there, and I like it. I don't like it. Now, Lot never got himself straightened out. And I'm going to run through the history of Lot here briefly. We could turn to them. I don't believe we're going to. But Lot was wrong way back in not getting along with Abraham, Abram at the time. He should have submitted. The herdsman got into a strife. And he shouldn't have been messing around with Abraham. Abraham had kind of raised him, had raised him. And, uh, you know, you should have gone to Abraham and said, hey, look, man, we're going to work this out. You know, I'll fire my herdsmen if they won't get along with yours. Because Abraham was a man. But, you know, Abraham said, look, choose what you will. Take this, whatever you want to do, and, and uh, you go your way, and I'll go mine. But see, Lot should have stuck with Abraham. Abraham was a great man of God. He shouldn't have left him. He should have stuck with him. Even if we go to Jacob and Laban, and you can research this later, but, but uh, Jacob was going to take off, and Laban, Laban said to him, Look, I've learned by experience that God has blessed me for you. Having Jacob around was good for Laban, and at least Laban, he was kind of a crook, but he didn't want to lose Jacob. Of course, Jacob was kind of a crook too. But, uh, you know, he, he at least recognized. And Lot never should have left Abraham, but he did. And Abraham said, Look, it's all before you. What do you want? Well, secondly, Lot was wrong to choose the well-watered plains of Sodom. In Genesis 13.10, he did that. We can take a look at it. Verse 8, Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not, verse 9, 13.9, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Then it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like unto the land of Egypt, as thou cometh unto Zoah. 
The Lord chose them all the plain of Jordan. And the Lord journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Man, that's another mistake. Where were you camping out? Who are you camping out with? Lot, Lot never got himself straightened out. He never should have separated from Abraham. When he did, he never should have chosen the well-watered plains of Sodom. Later in the story, when uh, the angels came to town, and angels, when you see them in the Bible, they appear as men. And the people of Sodom were sinners, and they came and they wanted those guys, I'll just say it, for sexual purposes. And Lot, trying to protect the, the, the strangers, the guests in his house, uh, offered his two daughters to that homosexual gang that wanted sex with the two angels that they thought were men. That would have been an adventure if they'd have got a hold of the two angels, I'll tell you that. But he offered his daughters. Then, somehow he compromised his uh, leadership, and, and I can't say this for sure, but in 19, and I'll explain that, but in 19, chapter 14, uh, chapter 19, verse 14, Lot went out. See, they told him in verse 13, For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The angel said, you know, we're here to destroy this city. It's a wicked place. We've come down to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now, I don't know who to blame on this one exactly, but I wonder if somehow he'd compromise his leadership with his sons-in-law. If you compromise with the world all the time, people around you are going to see it. And then you're going to come and you're going to try to pull a Bible position and they're going to say, hey, he hasn't lived this for 10 years. You know, oh, well, what do you get holy all of a sudden? No, we'll be fine. You take off. And they mocked him. He was wrong to compromise his leadership and his respect of his sons-in-law. And then we already read in verse 15 that he lingered. God told him to get out of town and he lingered. Now look. If you really knew this place was on fire, about to blow up, we would try to exit in an orderly, good Baptist manner. Amen? We have exits here, exit doors there, and let's move out in a proper manner. But I'll tell you what, you wouldn't be just hanging around saying, I think I'll sing one more verse. Amen? No, I just let me finish this little thing. I'm taking a little note here and I want to finish it up. No, the building's about to implode or explode, one or the other. Either way, you're going to be bits and pieces if you don't get out of here. You would not be lingering. And the angel said, get out of town. And he lingered. He was wrong to linger when God had told him to get out. And he was somehow wrong to not keep his wife in check. And again, I can't say this dogmatically. Maybe she was uncheckable. I said about a guy, a friend of mine one time, he is a friend of mine, so I said he was unpasturable. And now he's now a successful pastor in Santa Clarita. Which I figure proved my point. Probably most pastors are unpasturable if you really want to get down to it. <laughs> but he didn't keep his wife in check. Now, could he? I don't know. Was she uncheckable? I don't know. But she looked back. God told him not to look back. Get out of here and don't look back. And she looked back and she was petrified by God. Look at verse 26 of chapter 19. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. It's one thing to be a pillar of the faith. It's another thing to be turned into a pillar of salt. She looked back. She was petrified by God. And may I just suggest when she could have avoided that by being petrified of God. I thought that was a little better point than the reaction I got for it. 
We ought to fear God. Why wait till you're cast in a lake of fire to fear God? Fear God right now. Amen? Amen. And I would say a little social drinking got Lord and a little, little too social with his daughters. And then he made a real fool out of himself. You can check that all out. They got him drunk. He said, well, it's their fault. Listen, that first drink, you probably could have fought it off. Amen? Maybe you have to drunk enough that they can pour it down your throat. But that first drink, you could fight it off. And a little social drinking got him too social with his daughters. And we're still talking about this stuff today. Long time later, we're here Sunday morning still talking about Lot. And what a mess he made out of his life. Now, all of that might be just another story of some Christ-rejecting sinner, if it were not really for the kicker to the whole story. And if you have your Bibles, I'll read it if you don't, but turn right over to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And here's where the plot thickens a little bit, or a lot of bit. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Second Peter chapter 2. And I'll back up a little bit here. Verse 4. God, I mean, sometimes God brings punishment, folks. Verse 4. For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 6 and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those after that after should live ungodly. Ungodly, God said it. And delivered just Lot. Now you might say, you mean that means only Lot. Well, for one thing, it didn't deliver only Lot. He delivered Lot, his wife, and two daughters. Then his wife messed up her own deliverance. Just, in this case, means justified. Delivered just lot. Vexed with a filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, the Bible says, that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was a righteous man. So don't sit here today and say, oh, well, those stupid sinners, they don't know God. They no, wait a minute. The Bible says Lot was a righteous man. What happened? He got with the wrong crowd. He saw and he heard and he vexed his righteous soul with their unlawful deeds. And look what happened to him. Can you imagine? Lot was a man who we might say was essentially a good guy. Pretty good guy. He's a guy that violated some little principles. A couple of them pretty big. And those little violations, those little mistakes, oh, he just, hey, I'll go that way, the well-watered plain of Sodom. Oh, yeah, I know they're wicked sinners, but that's okay, I can handle myself. can't usually quote things under pressure. But the Bible says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Don't set your eyes on the well-watered plains of Sodom. Don't vex your, vex your soul among the wicked. It might rub off on you. Oh no, I'm the exception. Good luck with that, buddy. Watch yourself. Watch your step. 
He's a guy that violated some little principles and it sent his family spiraling to doubt. Doubt's one of the first things that'll get you. Then distrust. Then disrespect. Destruction, death, and disrepute. As long as people read this Bible, righteous lot will be held in disrepute. He made some little mistakes. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. It's okay to have a guest room, but don't invite the devil in, my friends. Amen? It's okay to have a prophet's chamber. It's okay to clean up when friends come over, but don't make room for the devil. Hey, I got 99% of my life given over to God. I just got this little 1% over here that's a little on the shady side. Don't try it. Don't give place to the devil. It may be a little thing, but it's a very big deal. And don't you ever get caught in a position where Jesus might say to you, as he said in John 8, 37, My word hath no place in you. My word hath no place in you. Here's a Bible that God has given to us. He tells us how to live our lives. He tells us how to serve him. Don't think you know more than this Bible. Don't try to explain your way around, circumvent the word of God. Don't let Jesus have to say to you, my word hath no place in you. Believe me, if that happens, it's no little thing. You mess up a little. You might end up a lot. You say, what do I do, preacher? If you haven't received Christ as Lord and Savior, you haven't got the ball rolling yet. You're headed for hell. You're going to split hell wide open when you die. Will I ever get out? Yeah, she'll get out and you go to a lake of fire for all eternity. What's going to happen to my body? It'll be burned up, but you've got a soulish body, and it'll be there burning. Read Luke 16. It's going to be a bad scene. He said, man, pretty narrow about all this, aren't you? I can show you in the Bible that you ought to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. If you'll put your trust in Jesus Christ, he'll save you. God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost will come and indwell you. And God the Spirit will teach you. And he'll testify of Christ. And he'll convince you of the things in this Bible and show you how to live your life so you don't mess up a little and become a lot. We got Christians all around here. And not one here that would say, boy, I sure am sorry I put my trust in Christ. There's not one, one Christian here that would say, boy, I'm sorry I tried to follow the Bible. Yeah, biggest mistake I made was following the Bible. No, that doesn't happen. I'm not saying we're perfect. But we know who's right and who's wrong. We know God's right and we're wrong. And he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, it's me again. I messed up the program again. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And he'll do it. You need to be in that position. What position is that? Sonship. I've got sons. Um, unlike yours, my sons are perfect. Our sons are perfect. Now listen, our kids have messed up. And boy, I'll tell you, it's not easy to raise a family. And some of them, every now and then, need a major kick in the seat of the pants. But they're still your kids. Amen? And you still love them. And when we come into sonship with God, he'll chastise us, he'll spank us. But there's a difference between being a son and being a stranger. And once you receive Christ, you have a relationship, you are headed for heaven. You couldn't go to hell if you wanted to. Because he then owns you. You've given your life to Christ. He takes possession of you. 
He takes responsibility for you, and then He teaches you how to live for Him. You say, boy, I don't know if I can do it. You, you can't do it. Jesus said, for without me you can do nothing. You can't do it. Put your trust in Christ and let Him do a work in you and through you and for you. You say, boy, it seems like a little thing. Just, you know, I get out. I was at Bangor Baptist, June 9th, 1974. I was under conviction. I knew the Bible was right. I was under conviction. So, well, Sunday night, threw my hymn book down, went down. Got down at the altar. Chet Littlefield came down. Told him I want to be saved. Prayed a simple prayer with Chet Littlefield. Telling God that I knew I was a sinner, that I was sorry, and I wanted to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. What's that take? 30 seconds? Got up and walked out. But see, I walked out a new creature in Christ. I'd been born again. And things have never been the same. He said, man, that little decision could do this? Yeah. It works from the negative, and it works from the positive. And I think of Robert Frost, that great New England poet, writing the, the poem about two roads diverged in a wood. And I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. And you come to a small angle, a small cross road, it may not be a 90 degree, and you say, well, I'm trying to look that much different. And you take a step this way, and you're not far away from that other road. Then you took a few more steps, and pretty soon the guy on the other road, you can't hardly see him. Then you walk for a couple days and he's out of sight. You've taken a different road. It was just a little step. But oh, what a difference it made. If you haven't been saved, take that little step today. Because I'll tell you, it means everything. Little things mean a lot. Father, we pray today, God, that you'd speak to our hearts and bless us, instruct us, correct us where it's necessary. And, oh, God, maybe there's somebody here that they really can't remember a time when they said yes to God. Yes, I want to put my trust in Jesus Christ. I don't want to trust myself. I want to trust his death, burial, and resurrection, what the Bible calls the gospel, his blood shed for my sins, I want to accept that and Him as my Lord and Savior. And I want to come and I just want to ask Him into my heart. I may never come back here again. or I don't know if I like this church or not, but I know this. I want to make sure I'm saved. That can be accomplished. And I would just pray, God, that anybody here that is not sure they're saved, that you'd speak to their hearts. They'd come and receive Christ today. And for the Christians... We ought to look at Lot and see they're not a non-Christian. We ought to see in type a Christian that got himself in a whole lot of trouble. God, we ought to say, God, protect me from that. That I may keep a humble attitude. That I might stay right in the word of God and in his path. Grant it, we pray. We'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory. We ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.